uh, as I'm reading here, director of aquatic programs for Princeton Hydro. He has expertise uh, in so many areas that we deal with. I'm not gonna take the time to take five minutes <laughs> to cover his background, uh, but he has over 20 years of experience and uh, he's the guy we go to quite often. And he's a member of Princeton Hydro, uh, an outstanding organization. I have to admit that. <laughs> uh, so Thank let you. me introduce Dr. Fred Lubno. All right. Thank you very much, Ernie. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone can see this. Um, so just to confirm, can everyone see my presentation? I can, yes. Excellent. Yes, Thank you. I can see it. Thank you. Uh, so yes, I'll be talking about the management and monitoring of harmful algal blooms, and I will be talking about the cyanotoxins as well. Uh, Stephanie uh, covered a lot of this material. Uh, um, she did a great job, so I'll be able to skim through a lot of this stuff. Um, so uh, when we talk about freshwater algae, specifically for lakes, there are three main types of algae. There are the planktonic, the phytoplankton, those are the free-floating algae. Uh, that can make the water look green or create those surface scums. Then we have the benthic mat algae, which is, I, I call it the green cotton candy. Uh, and then finally, there are a small group of green algae called stoneworts that um, look like plants, but technically uh, they're algae. There are all kinds of algal groups. Most of them are very beneficial in terms of they per, they're the base of the food, of, of the lake food web. So they provide food for the zooplankton, which are the little micro animals in the water who in turn are food for small fish and then for large fish. Um, the group we'll be talking about sp specifically are frequently referred to as blue-green algae, um, but their more technical term is cyanobacteria. They're essentially bacteria that pretend to be plants. They photosynthesize. And they are very successful um, in lake environments. So they can photosynthesize in a wide variety of light intensities so there's certain cyanobacteria that do great right on the surface, creating those surface scums, and then there are others that prefer deeper waters. Um, many of them create spores called aconites. So as the water temperature cools down, these spores will be created. They fall to the sediments. Uh, springtime, when the lake mixes, it brings those aconites back up and they hatch. Uh, some of them can also fix nitrogen. They have heterocysts. And this is one of the reasons why in freshwater systems, we tend to focus so much more on phosphorus than nitrogen uh, because as phosphorus concentrations increase, not only do you have more algae, but you get more of the bad algae, more of the cyanobacteria. And one of the reasons is because they can fix their own nitrogen from the atmosphere. So they're not dependent on nitrogen for their growth. It's really phosphorus that drives it. But to fix nitrogen, you need a lot of phosphorus. So many of them have a lot of enzymes uh, that allow them to cleave phosphorus off organic compounds. Those enzymes are called alkaline phosphatases. Um, as I'm sure everyone's familiar, they can regulate their position in the water column through gas vacuoles, and that's how they can make those nasty surface scums. They can float to the surface, photosynthesize, uh, and then they can, can collapse those gas vacuoles, sink to deeper waters where there may be more uh, nutrient-rich concentrations. And then finally, they generate these large colonies that make them difficult to be grazed on by the zooplankton, but they also create what, what are called cyanotoxins. Um, so what are cyanotoxins? Essentially, they're a really diverse group of mostly low molecular weight molecules produced by the cyanobacteria. And they have a negative impact on the health of pets, livestock, and humans. This is one of the reasons why we're very concerned about cyanotoxins. And I have to emphasize there are dozens upon dozens of these compounds. Uh, various strains within a species um, may or may not produce these cyanotoxins, as Stephanie uh, mentioned. Um, there's no distinct relationship that if you have A, B, and C, you'll create cyanotoxins. Um, most studies say that if that population is under some type of stress, it will begin to produce cyanotoxins. Uh, there are three main groups. Uh, there are the hepatotoxins, the neurotoxins, and the dermatoxins. Um, and I do need to emphasize that cyanotoxins are not taste and odor compounds. Now, this comes up very frequently. Cyanotoxins are colorless, they're tasteless, they're odorless. 
So there are taste and odor compounds associated with cyanobacteria, uh, such as geosmin and MIB. And they're very problematic in drinking water supplies, but those compounds do not pose a health risk. And unfortunately, there's no straight relationship between the taste and odor compounds and the cyanotoxins. So you can have a water body that's producing taste and odor compounds and is not producing any cyanotoxins. I'll give you an example. Um, we work with Lambertville Reservoir, which is the drinking water supply for, for Lambertville. Um, we've been monitoring that system since 2013. And we, when we monitor for cyanotoxins, we, we have never yet received a hit on cyanotoxins, but they have a lot of problems with taste and odor compounds. So obviously that's problematic, but you know, conveying that information that yes, we're managing for those taste and odor compounds, but they're not that health, potential health risk that the cyanotoxins are. And then on the flip side, you can have cyanotoxins and no taste and odor compounds. So again, I wanna emphasize just because you, you, you're you smelling something doesn't necessarily mean you have cyanotoxins. Um, some of the more common cyanotoxins, and I'm identifying these four, and again, I wanna emphasize there are other cyanotoxins that are not listed here. There are a wide variety. There are dozens upon dozens of them. But New Jersey recognizes uh, four of them. So the first one are, are, are a group called microcystins. So they're a group of about 100 different toxin variants. They tend to be the, the most common cyanotoxin that we find in the mid-Atlantic. So if we get a hit on anything, it's usually microcystins. Uh, and I, you, there's the EPA threshold there for recreational activity of of eight micrograms per liter. And I'll show you the New Jersey thresholds in, in, in a bit. There's another one called cylindrospermopsin. Um, it's mostly a hepatotoxin. Uh, it is um, rare. I don't, I think for the four years we've been monitoring, we may have seen one water body have cylindrospermopsin. Uh, and that's EPA threshold of um, 15 micrograms per liter. The next two um, don't- Dr. Love now? Yes. Is, um, Sabine Watson is asking, is there any way to attack the ac aconites through the winter while dormant? Am I saying that yeah. word right? A-K-I-N-E-T-E-S? The aconites. Yeah. That, that is really difficult because, I mean, those are resting spores. So they have extremely heavy cell walls. Um, those aconites are designed to... Um, to survive in a wide variety of conditions. Like they can be desiccated. You can hit them with all sorts of chemicals. I mean, they're resistant, they're inactive. So you can think of it as sort of like a, a, a protective coating or a seed. So it's, I haven't seen anything where someone has been targeting aconites uh, as, as a way of controlling halves. Um, if you dredged, you'd be removing a lot of those aconites, but you know, um, cyanobacteria are very cosmopolitan. They could, you know, if those conditions are right, you have high phosphorus concentrations, they will eventually uh, begin to grow. Um, so I'm not familiar with any way of directly controlling the aconites, but I do know um, they're very resilient. Um, so, you know, for the cyanotoxins, like I mentioned, uh, microcystin is the most common, um, cylindrospermopsum and microcystin are the two that EPA recognizes right now. Um, right now, New Jersey has recreational advisories for these other two, anatoxin A and saxitoxin. So anatoxin A is, is a neurotoxin. Um, EPA is working on their recommended threshold. Um, New Jersey DEP already has one. And then saxitoxin DEP just posted this year. It's a very potent neurotoxin. It's a, from my experience, it's very rare in freshwater systems it tends to show up more in marine or estuarine systems. So if you red tides are very familiar, uh, are, are, are typically associated with saxitoxins. And if you're familiar with paralytic shellfish poisoning, it's usually associated with saxitoxins. So um, this is just showing you the New Jersey threshold advisories. And again, I have to emphasize these are advisories. These aren't regulated compounds. Um, EPA just finished a three-year study uh, on a variety of cyanotoxins, and they're gonna determine whether or not they should have actual regulated thresholds. But right now, these are all advisory. Um, so here I have uh, the, the four cyanotoxins, and here, what, here are New Jersey's recommended criteria that they had in 2017, and here they are for um, in 2021 for this year they've posted. And, and like I said, they just put saxitoxin on this year. So, um, the take home message here is at least for microcystin and cylindrospermopsin, 
New Jersey's concentrations are lower than EPA's for their recommended advisories. Uh, and just to show you what some of these uh, organisms look like under the scope, here are some, uh, some of the more common cyanobacteria. This is microcystis here. Uh, this is the lictrospermum. It used to be called anabena. This clear cell here, that's the heterocyst. So that's where a, um, a, a, a blue-green algae, a cyanobacteria can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. And finally, we have anthanazomenon here. If your lake looks like it has like grass clippings in it, it's probably amphanazominone. And um, something to keep in mind is just because the water looks nasty, again, doesn't necessarily mean you have uh, a cyanobacteria or cyanotoxin. So here's a bloom of that dolictospermum, and this is a bloom of euglena. Um, this organism produces cyanotoxins, or at least has the potential to produce them. This one doesn't. So very frequently, you know, microscopic confirmation needs to be done to identify whether or not we have some type of cyanobacteria or something that does not produce cyanotoxins. Um, and as Stephanie mentioned, we do use some field testing um, for, the, um, for the cyanotoxins. Uh, we'll use the Abraxas field kits. Um, we use these primarily almost like the canary in the coal mine. So if we wanna see whether or not the compounds are present or not, um, once we detect a compound, that's where we may recommend either the drinking water facility or the recreational lake to grab a sample and send it immediately to a laboratory for analysis. So we find these field tests are fairly reliable. Um, over the last four years, we've used them. We've had maybe a handful of false positives, um, but we use them primarily as like presence or absence, and they tend to be very valuable in, in that capacity. Um, if you want a cyanotoxin bloom. There's typically three things that will produce such blooms. So seasonally high water temperatures, still water conditions, or if a deep lake, uh, thermal stratification, and elevated phosphorus concentration. So once the phosphorus concentrations exceed 0 0.03 milligrams per liter, uh, that's when you see you have the increased risk of having a HAB. Uh, and I'm just going to touch very briefly on this, but with climate change, we have been seeing warmer and wetter conditions um, throughout the mid-Atlantic states. And I know I'm going to sound like an old guy, but I remember sampling Mohawk and Swartzwood in the early 90s and I, in the winter. And I remember having to carve through one or two feet of ice yeah, to get the yeah. water samples. And now we're lucky if we get ice covered. This past winter was, was actually closer to a normal winter than we've had for a number of years. Um, and I'm sure people have seen this before. This is just showing in the Northeast, the increase in the annual temperature um, throughout the mid-Atlantic states over the decades. But I think even more interesting for this group, uh, this is showing Lake Apacon. So this is essentially my career as a consultant. I started working with Steve Souza with Coastal Environmental Services around 1992-93. This is just graphing surface water uh, temperatures from July at Lake Apacon over the last almost 30 years. And we have a statistically significant increasing trend in temperature. So this allows for the opportunity for these cyanobacteria blooms to thrive because they prefer these warmer water environments. This is also having a negative impact on the um, carryover trout um, habitat that we see at Lake Apacon as well. So we're seeing some real world impacts associated with climate change. Um, like Stephanie mentioned how 2014 was a watershed moment for Ohio and for Lake Erie when it came to HABs. For New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania, 2019 was sort of the watershed moment. That um, 2019, once we got into June of 2019, we got into this weather pattern. So this is precipitation data from Morris County. We got into this pattern where we get these short, intense storms followed by a couple days of some sunny weather short intense storms followed by sunny weather. And so what was happening is we would get um, a, a short storm, essentially rinsing the watershed, transporting all those nutrients into the receiving waterways and then having some nice sunny weather. That resulted in these halves in Lake Apacon. We saw, we saw them in other lakes throughout New Jersey, uh, New York and Pennsylvania. And we've seen halves before at Lake Apacon, but they tended to occur in September and October um, after Labor Day. So once it hits after Labor Day, it's not negatively impacting the recreational use and the local economy as much as it did when it hit early in June. 
Um, so that was one of the reasons why this was so devastating is now, obviously, if you're living at a lake, any hab, any time of the year is bad. But um, the fact that it started so early really had a negative impact on the recreational and economy of Lake Apacon. And so as part of that, um, we graphed um, in June, the average June concentration of Lake Apacon. So Lake Apacon, we're trying to keep the phosphorus concentrations at 0 0.03 milligrams per liter. Um, I'm not gonna get into all the details of, of what was going on over the last 30 years, but I do wanna point out that, you know, from, you know, um, 2010 to 2020, we were seeing this increasing trend in the average phosphorus concentrations in June. And we just happened to sample the lake in June about a week before the HAB hit. Um, and what we saw was once, the con once that average concentration exceeded 0 0.04 milligrams per liter, that's what triggered the HAB event at Lake Apacon. Um, and that's, that was the result of that in 2019. Uh, now, we've been working um, with the Lake Apacon Commission. Um, we've been working with the counties, the municipalities, the commission, the foundation, Rutgers University. Um, we've been working on a large HAB grant, and I'll talk about some. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'll talk about some of those projects. But also, in addition to that, we've been working with the Highlands, New Jersey Highlands Council. We're updating their restoration plan to be a watershed implementation plan. And then also we're developing a specific beach restoration plan for Mount Arlington's um, municipal beach. So as a result of the HAB, all these activities were going on. Now the, the Highlands Council was just timing. We actually started working on updating their management plan at the end of 2018. So it just so happened it was actually, while the HAB was, a, was an unfortunate event, at least we were updating the plan right when the HAB was occurring. Um, and so the commission received um, a grant from New Jersey to evaluate a wide variety of near shore watershed or near shore in lake measures to mitigate or manage halves. And I'm just bringing this up because at the end of this year when this report is complete, while this report will evaluate these specifically for Lake Apacon, the value to these is it, this document will be available to everyone, including everyone in COLA, and you'll be able to determine whether or not this specific technique would be um, appropriate for either your lake or your beach or a section of your lake. So um, we will be making that document available. And that was one of the things that, um, one of the reasons why they received the grant was DEP liked the idea that th this information is going to be shared with all the lake groups throughout the state. Um, so when we talk about these in lake or watershed measures, I do want to remind everyone there's no magic bullet that will take care of all the issues. Um, you have your in lake measures that tend to focus more on controlling aquatic plant growth, HABs, sedimentation, and then you have the longer term watershed measures focus on stormwater, septic leaching, which I'll talk a little bit about, and then internal loading. And again, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but Again, everything, no matter what measure you're talking about, everything has its benefit or value, its limitations, potential permit requirements, capital costs, monitoring, long-term costs, and maintenance requirements. Whatever measure you're thinking of, whether it's just doing a simple copper treatment or installing a large uh, wetland basin to take care of stormwater, every measure should, should take these components into account. Uh, and again, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna get into uh, these in, in much detail. Uh, Phoslock is essentially a compound that inactivates phosphorus either from the water column or from the sediments. As part of this, we did a 50 acre treatment in the Southern end of Lake Apacon and Landing Channel. Um, we did, a, a fi again, a 50 acre treatment. We applied 22,000 pounds of the product and um, we established water quality goals based on chlorophyll and total phosphorus based on the lake's TMDL, as well as goals in terms of water clarity. And we uh, essentially met them, this, this um, blue bar here is soluble reactive phosphorus. So this is like the candy to the algae. And we did see that those bottom water concentrations <laughs> remained, lo remained low. We're continuing to monitor that station in the southern end of the lake to see how long we can keep that effectiveness uh, under control. And this is just showing you that the clarity remained at or above one meters after the pre-treatment. We also did a green clean treatment. Green clean is a strong oxidizing 
It's a product, it's an alternative to copper. It's, it's also said to break down taste and odor compounds and break down cyanotoxins. It's more expensive than copper. Um, we did two treatments of Green Clean. We did one in an open beach area. We got some improvement in clarity, but it didn't last very long. Part of that was because the beach was part of the open um, area of the lake. Uh, in contrast, I'll just go here just real quickly. Um, we did a green clean treatment in this two acre cove. This was far more effective because we didn't have that transfer of the water from the main body of the lake. Um, I do wanna just identify that we're also working with a product called biochar. So biochar is essentially processed wood material that has a high affinity to remove pollutants. A couple of advantages to the product is it's relatively low in cost. So one of these four foot sleeves here costs about $19. Um, so we did a project where we installed a bunch of biochar in, in streams, in some stormwater ponds, and some manufactured treatment devices. Um, but the other advantage to this product is when you're done with it, you can use it as landscaping mulch. So disposal is very green and you can use it as, as mulch. Um, so here are some of the projects we did. Here are two of our team members, Ivy and Katie, installing some of the biochar in a stream going in the Lake of Pacon. There are two stormwater ponds we installed. And then this year we've installed them in stormwater structures. Uh, again, I, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about this. What I do wanna say is that the streams had a limited capacity of removing phosphorus and talking to the manufacturer, that is because you need a high, you, you need an extended contact time between the product and the water. So the highest we were getting was maybe 50%, 58% of phosphorus removal in the streams. And it didn't seem to last very long. Like it seemed like we would have to replace the material in less than three months. In contrast though, in stormwater ponds, we were getting very high removal rates, as high as 80 or you know, almost 100% removal. Um, and this was, this, we were getting some pretty good removal rates for up to six months. Now, I, we left the biochar in over the winter, um, and then after seven and a half months, we weren't getting any removal of the, of the dissolved phosphorus. We were removing about half of the particulate. So uh, this is the thing about the biochar, you do have to replace it about once every three to six months I'm sort of hoping with a lot of our lake communities, if they're going to install them in stormwater ponds or if they're going to install them in beach areas, you could possibly install them say in April, May. And if you can get that efficiency so that by September, October, you can remove that stuff and then use it as mulch, that might be a good way of handling some of this excessive phosphorus in some of these near shore areas. Um, and this, I'm, I'm really proud of this because there are two large aqua filters in the borough of Pacon that originally the filter media was pretty expensive. Um, we installed them right before the recession uh, and the commission was responsible for cleaning them out. The commission lost the um, staff to clean it out. So the, um, the borough did continue to clean out the, uh, the, the pre-treatments, but they just didn't have the funding uh, to continue with the filter media. Um, and so what we did though, is we said, well, that filter media was expensive. You know, the borough didn't know how to deal with the material. We, we just, this just happened this week. We cleaned the material out and I got this photo from one of our engineers, Amy, just yesterday. They just installed the uh, biochar into this system. So now what we're going to be doing is once we get some rain events, we'll be, a, be able to evaluate how effective the biochar is at removing phosphorus in these large stormwater basins. Again, I mentioned this, this is Ashley Cove. We did a, a, a green clean treatment, but we also used Phoslock. And I just wanna emphasize that here we got the phosphorus, you know, before um, we did any projects in Ashley Cove, the average phosphorus concentration was 0 0.07. Last year, we got it down to 0 0.04. So we're close to that 0 0.03. Um, so we're working on that. But as you can see, we definitely had a improvement in terms of water quality, water quality and just the, the way the the, the cove looked after we started implementing those restoration techniques. And then I'm just going to wrap Dr. up. Love there. now. Yep, go ahead. We, we have a couple of questions about the biochar. Sure, um, sure. Bob Smith is asking, does the biochar installation require any permitting? And Stephanie is asking, can the biochar be regenerated? That's a, that, those are really good questions. I can tell you that um, for Hapacon, we basically just um, filed a, a, a permit permit by, by rule saying that we're installing this stuff, 
Um, let us know if you have any issue with it. And they did not have an issue with Lake Apacon. Now we are working with a project with New Jersey Water Supply Authority. And there we're installing some of the biochar in some specific projects in the Mohawkaway. The Mohawkaway is a C1 water. So there we did have to get a, a permit um, because of it, the sensitivity of that water. So it really depends on what you're using it for. If you're installing this stuff in say a small pond, that's say a stormwater pond that flows into your lake, since that's a stormwater structure, you should not have an issue with that. Um, the other thing too, is if you're putting it in a beach area, uh, that may not be an issue as well. The reason why we did ask with a pack on were the stream sites, because you don't wanna be in a situation where you may have issues um, with some sort of localized flooding or some sort of clogging of a culvert. Uh, so depending on what type of you know, waterway you have, you may or may not need a permit. That's what, we, that's what we have found from our experience. And then in terms of regenerating, it's, in, it's interesting you said that because um, the company that we buy the biochar from, they'll actually buy it back because then they sell it to golf courses or ag companies. Because think of it, the biochar, what you're doing is as the nitrogen and phosphorus is flowing through, it's being stuck onto the wood material. It's being adsorbed onto that. So the reason why after a period of time, it's, it, it's no longer functioning is, is twofold. One is those bonding sites are being filled up, but two is, the, the second is you start to see algae growing on, on, on the biochar. And that's, that's what the manufacturer said, a good indication if you're not sampling, if you start seeing like a white crust or some algae growing on it, that's when you have to remove it. The company will purchase the material, um, and they sell it back and, and, and they'll, they're willing to do that. Now, most of our clients um, are municipalities and we've had training sessions on building these, installing them and replacing them for the four municipalities at Lake Apacon. And all municipalities said, well, we're gonna be dealing with such a small amount of material, we're just going to use it as landscaping mulch. I mean, usually it's, it's, it's larger. If you have a larger amount of material, you may need, um, you may be able to have that capacity to sell it back, but yeah, it can be used. And, and think of it when it's being used in that landscaping capacity, you want those terrestrial plants to use up that material. We have a couple more questions. Can sure. the biochar, from Paul, can the biochar cause damming of streams leading to property flooding, especially during storms? And Sabine Watson is asking, does biochar have any impact on alum? Okay, well, uh, so a couple things there is, so with the biochar, again, that's one of the reasons why we, we, we spoke to DEP and we showed them where we were installing the biochar in those streams. Um, from our projects, we did not have any flooding issues. I can tell you after a couple storms, the biochar was found, you know, maybe about 50 feet down where it was originally installed. I think at one point, some of the biochar was up on the stream bank. Um, what we did though last year is for the stormwater manufacturer treatment devices, we played around with particle size intentionally. And that we did that with Jefferson Township. And we did find that if we used too small of a material, um, we would get some localized backing up and flooding. And, and fortunately, Jefferson worked with us on that. So we played around with particle size, trying to get smaller particles um, to allow it to hold the water longer. But at the same time, if it's too small and it starts to flood, that's an issue. So we had to have a mix of small and large particles. So last year we played around with particle size to avoid flooding. This is the year, actually in late April, we installed that, that small and large particle mix in some of these manufacturer treatment devices. And we are gonna evaluate the removal efficiency. So that is something that you do have to take into account. And in terms of alum, um, Sabine, that's a really good point that, you know, if you have an alum, alum injection system, within a water, within say a stream, I wouldn't use biochar in that same stream unless, unless the biochar is upgrading of where that injection system is. Um, and again, that's because if you have the biochar immediately below the injection system, it, it may end up binding up a lot of that alum that you want it to bind up with phosphorus. Um, once it's in, in a water body, I don't see that as being an issue because it's such, such a low dose concentration. But um, if you have an injection system on a stream and you wanted to use biochar, it'd be best to do it upgrading and not downgrading. All right. Okay. And then just to wrap up the HAB grants, um, 
uh, we were installing three types of nearshore innovative aeration systems. Um, so last year we installed Lakeshore Hills Country Club, uh, an air curtain uh, we installed at Lake Forest Yacht Club, a nano bubble system with ozone to help break down the algae and, and the um, cyanotoxins. And then this year, and it's, it's gonna happen probably next week at this point, um, we're installing a nano bubble system for the Mount Arlington uh, Beach. Um, and so this year we'll evaluate whether or not these systems are good at mitigating or managing an accumulation of HAPs. So like the air curtain we've used in other lake communities, it is, it's essentially agitating the water. It makes it more difficult for the algal cells to accumulate along the beach area. Uh, the nano bubble system, this is the first time we're using nano bubbles. They're supposed to be very effective at managing uh, water and keeping it oxygenated. We're using one with ozone, one with not o no ozone. Again, the ozone helps to break up the organic matter, including the algae. So we're gonna evaluate this year uh, these three systems. And this is just showing you last year, the installation of those units. Um, I'm not gonna get into the remaining projects. Um, I do wanna say though that, um, you know, we've been working with Rutgers. Rutgers has overseen a rain garden workshop. We've had at least two of them up at Lake Apacon where um, uh, local property owners are showed, are, are show, they're, they're provided training on, you know, the design and installation of rain gardens. And I can tell you from my experience, rain gardens as well as larger systems called biofiltration systems are very effective at removing phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, so again, we'll be wrapping up those projects. I do wanna to touch on some of the stuff that um, Stephanie mentioned. So chlorophyll versus phycocyanin. And again, Stephanie did such a great job about that. I, I'm not gonna get into uh, details on that. You know, so chlorophyll A is, it, it's, it's an, when you measure chlorophyll A, you're getting an idea of all the algae. When you measure phycocyanin, essentially in freshwater systems, you're getting an idea of all the cyanobacteria. Um, there was something interesting this spring that we were getting high phycocyanin but there were very little um, cyanobacteria. And it turns out there is a small group of algae called, actually it's not chrysophytes, it's uh, cryptomonads. And the cryptomonads actually have phycocyanin. So we had a bloom of the cryptomonads, which is a very good algae. Um, they're a great source of food for your zooplankton. But for the most part, phycocyanin is very effective at quantifying uh, that cyanobacteria biomass. And you know there was that discussion about cell counts. Um, and one of the reasons why, um, you know, cell counts is so important in New Jersey is DEP relies um, very heavily on cell counts relative to what sort of advisory they put up. And the reason why they use cell counts is they recognize that, you know, yes, the microcystins are the most common cyanotoxin, but there are dozens upon dozens of compounds. And you just don't have the money, the time, the capacity to measure all of these compounds. So they use cell counts as a surrogate. And that's why they use the cell counts as a surrogate, you know, for these levels. Now, what they are doing is they're using data from meters like Stephanie mentioned, and I'll show you some of that data. And they're establishing relationships between what they perceive it as a cell count relative to the measurement of phycocyanin. And the benefit to this, and again, Stephanie talked about this beautifully, you know, you're collecting real-time data, whether it is a continuous monitoring, such as they at, like they have at Manasquan Reservoir, or they'll be installing at Greenwood and a PACCON, or if it's a meter and you have a beach area and you want to daily measure that beach area, it's very effective of getting that real-time data to make a management decision whether or not you're on a, an alert or an advisory level. Um, so, Dr. And Love, now, can I ask um, one other question? Sabine Watson is asking, mm -hmm. Are you expecting the nano bubbles to assist with plant growth? The nano bubbles are actually supposed to be better at managing and mitigating the nutrients. So keeping things oxygenated allows bacterial decomposition to go high. And the manufacturers of the nano bubble systems are saying that when the bubbles are in there longer, it makes it more difficult for the cyanobacteria to take advantage of the nutrients. So um, and again, the nano bubble systems for us is brand new technology. We, we, so we just installed them last year. We're going to evaluate them this year coming up. Uh, and again, we're going to compare just a nano bubble system to a nano bubble system with ozone. So they're saying that um, those nano bubbles last longer in the water column than, than a standard aeration system. And it's supposed to keep 
rates of decomposition high so that the bacteria use up the nutrients and it makes it more difficult for the blue-green algae or the cyanobacteria to have access to those nutrients. So um, hopefully about this time next year or maybe the end of this year, you know, we'll be able to present on that, on that data. Chris um, Zacker also has one question perfect. for you. Hold one second. Sure. Chris, you can go ahead and ask Dr. Lubna your question. My apologies. I have a five-year-old and she just touched my phone. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you this has been really informative <laughs> good good no problem all right um well if your five-year-old has a question you know he or she can you know feel free to ask <laughs> so um yeah so basically um like i said because of all the issues with all the different kinds of cyanotoxins that's why dep relies on cell counts but they recognize you know sending a sample to a lab the lab has to prepare it. It takes at least 24 hours to set a sample up before they can even run it. They have to run it. They have to enter the data and get it back to the client. So it takes time. Um, it, it can even take longer if you're grabbing a sample for a specific cyanotoxin and sending it to a lab. So that's the advantage of these meters. You can get that real-time data. So I did mention we do use the field, um, uh, the, the field measurements just you know, to, for presence of absence of cyanotoxins. But these are some of the meters. And, and again, um, I do want to mentioned that um, the meters that Stephanie identified as well as these two meters that I identify here, um, DEP, you know, and again, first of all, I'm not a representative of DEP. And second of all, DEP does not, uh, does not condone or, or support any product. But what I can tell you is the meters that Stephanie has, has, has talked about that her company produces, the Turner meters, the in situ meters, they've all DEP has identified in their public HAB meetings that these are um, good meters to use to measure chlorophyll A and phycocyan. Um, I can tell you for us, last year, we started using this handheld Turner, meeting, Turner, meeting, Turner meter for both chlorophyll A and phycocyanin. Um, we bought another set this year. Um, and then we also bought, we invested in one of these large scale ones. So this in situ meter, and again, I wanna emphasize what Stephanie said, temperature, um, dissolved oxygen and pH, extremely important parameters, especially if you have a deeper lake, you know, whether you're recreational or drinking water, knowing what's going on through the water column can detect a deep water bloom. And we've seen that in say Manasquan Reservoir where halfway down the reservoir, you have a deep water cyanobacteria bloom developing that um, after a storm event brings those cells to the surface. So those meters are very valuable. And so what we did last year is every time we grabbed a sample for cell counts, we also measured phycocyanin. So we did this for Lake Apacon, and it may not seem so, but this is a statistically significant trend. And it, it's, a, it's a pretty tight relationship. So R squared, you can think of R squared as from zero to one, one being a complete discrete relationship, zero being no relationship. We were at 0.8. So this is a pretty good relationship. We've seen it at other lakes too. So here's Upper Mohawk Lake. We also use data from Lake Mohawk. Uh, and matter of fact, um, I'll show you some data from all the lakes. We also did a handful of lakes in the center part of the state. So here's a st statistically significant uh, trend between the cell counts and the phycocyanin for Mercer Lake. But I want to emphasize this doesn't always occur. So here's Dr. Spring Lake. Oh, go ahead. Dr. I'm sorry. Dr. Love, now I'm sorry. How no, no, difficult, uh, Paul is asking, how difficult is the calibration on the phycocyanin meters? They're, they're fairly simple. So usually they're calibrated. Um, by, a, um, by a product you buy from, from a company. So it'd be like a, um, uh, some sort of dye that you would get from a company. And then that, that dye is at a specific concentration and that's what you use for the handheld. I'm more familiar with the handheld, the new in situ meter that we just purchased this year. I'm not as familiar with the calibration with that, but for any of these probes for dissolved oxygen, pH, you definitely need to calibrate them. So pH can be a little elaborate, DO can be a little elaborate. My understanding with the um, chlorophyll A and the phycocyanin, they've been, you know, you need to calibrate them, but they're relatively easy to calibrate. Um, and I, I, again, I just, I'm showing Spring Lake here because this is a shallow lake that was dominated by a lot of aquatic vegetation. So it had, you can see the cyanobacteria cell counts very low. So no relationship at all between phycocyanin and cyanobacteria. And part of this may be, you know, you look at this one, it's like, um, well, how come we got five 
but no cyanobacteria. Remember I mentioned you have those cryptomonads, those freshwater, um, small group of freshwater algae. So this, this may have been a bloom of the cryptomonads right here. So no cyanobacteria. And again, this relationship, this lack of a, of a, of a relationship is because of shallow water body, a lot of aquatic vegetation. And again, keep in mind that you may have a lake where you have uh, a beach on one end that uh, has deeper water and may have a strong relationship. And you may have a beach on the other adjacent to say shallow water with a lot of aquatic vegetation that may not have this relationship. So just keep that in mind that, you know, it's not just lake specific, it may be beach or site specific as well. But this is showing you all the data that we have. So the five lakes from Mercer County, Lake Mohawk, um, some Greenwood Lake data, some Upper Mohawk data, some, uh, um, and a lot of the Hapakon data. So this is just showing you, we have this increasing trend that, you know, as phycocyanin concentrations increase, we had this increase in cyanobacteria bacteria cell counts. And this is what I'm really proud of. And I got to give props to um, Pat Rose, one of our scientists. He's the one who crunched all the numbers who did this. So he compared our cell counts relative to measuring phycocyanin to DEP's cell counts. And we had a pretty good relationship relative to how you would ascribe your alert level. So, you know, green means there's no alert level, blue you're on a watch and then you get up to an alert. So you can see that it was a pretty good relationship and that made us feel good that, okay, you know, we Princeton Hydro measuring cell counts and taking a measurement of phycocyanin we had a pretty good relationship to what DEP sees relative to what they would attribute as a, you know, an advisory relative to an alert. So that made us feel good that, you know, we're, we're using the meters and we're doing the methodology appropriately. Again, the, the design is for any lake, you would probably want to do a study like this, where, you know, at least for one year, you're collecting cell counts versus phycocyanin. So then the goal will be to say, okay, you know, if we're at a watch, we're at a watch at 15. And so that's what you want to do. So for example, where you're at a watch, usually that's at 20,000. So if you're measuring your meter for Upper Mohawk Lake and you hit 15 or higher for your phycocyanin, that's when you can decide whether or not to post something or let, you know, the community know there may be an issue. So again, very valuable information. Uh, and then the last thing I just want to touch on very quickly um, people were um, inquiring about septic management. Uh, just, um, I, I'm, I'm an adjunct professor at DelVal University. Um, I just finished our watershed management class and I have a whole section on septic management. I'm not gonna give you that whole presentation. I just wanna identify that for septic management, you know, you have the three components of a septic system. You have your piping infrastructure, your septic tank and your leach field. I'm just showing you a little more details. Um, I do wanna, uh, forward a couple points. One is a failing system means you have major problems with that system. Um, and usually you can identify a failing system by, you know, some pooling water at the leach field or unusually green, you know, growth. Um, this is the community I live, where I live, we sort of have hybrid systems that all of our waste is pumped from our homes to a package plant. And then that treated water goes into this these are essentially a, a, a whole, a, a hill of leach fields. A couple of years ago, I saw this and I, I let our homeowner community know. I said, hey, there's something going on with this leach field. There's something going on with this system. You may have to take care of it. You know, they ignored it. A year later, water was spouting out of this, running down the hill. So they did have to take care of it, but it took water spilling out. But I'm emphasizing a failing system because a failing system is usually associated with a health problem with bacterial contamination. You can have a system that is still functioning. So it's cleaning up the water relative to bacterial contamination, but it's still a net source of phosphorus. And I've had a number of conversations with Rutgers and other uh, uh, organizations about this. So, because a lot of people say, well, oh, we just have to worry about the failing systems contributing phosphorus. It's like, no, really it's depending on the age of the system. The older the system, the higher the chance that it's a net source of phosphorus. And again, remember the biochar, I was talking about binding sites, sort of the same thing. You have a certain number of binding sites for phosphorus and over time those fill up and you'll start having a plume of phosphorus going into a lake or stream. Um, and this is just showing you 
This is actual measurements of phosphor we did. This is the this is the septic system for the municipal building for West Milford. So as part of a grant we had with them, we measured phosphorus concentrations, up gradient and down gradient of a septic system, not surprising, substantially higher amounts of phosphorus coming immediately down gradient of that system. Um, but the last thing I do wanna talk about, when you talk about on-site wastewater management, I really wanna focus on just mandatory pump outs that you know pumping a system out for a year round dwelling, um, once every three years, if it's seasonal, once every five years, it's extremely important. Um, by pumping out routinely, I just wanna jump down to this bottom fact that, and, and again, this is based on studies I've seen from Penn State as well as Cornell, that if you're pumping your system out once every three years, you are gonna reduce your individual lot contribution of phosphorus by 10 to 30%. There have been a number of studies, and most of them in New York, um, that show that if you're routinely pumping out, you're going to remove that phosphorus, you're going to reduce your individual load by 10 to 30 percent. And many of the communities in northern New Jersey, I, like Capacon, more than 80 percent of the, of the phosphorus load for Lake Capacon comes from stormwater and septic management similar to Mohawk, very similar to Mohawk, that the vast majority of the, of the nutrients now at Mohawk are coming in from the watershed, from stormwater and septic management. Mohawk, over the last 20, 25 years, has done a lot to really take care of their internal load. And they've really got that under control with their combination of the alum treatments, the injection systems, and the aeration systems to really lock that deep water phosphorus. And we've seen improvements in terms of water quality there. Um, so, and they do have a pretty um, aggressive pump out program, but I do wanna emphasize that for any community where you're on septic, at a minimum, if you can pump out that system once every three years, it will really help to reduce that individual phosphorus load. Uh, so in conclusion, and, and again, I'm, I know there's a lot going on here and I apologize for going over, um, climate change will exacerbate these HAB events. You know, and really the key locally is reducing the phosphorus, the, available, the availability of phosphorus for these HABs. Um, you know, and a combination of in-lake and watershed actions are required. Uh, you may need, a watershed implementation plan, or you may need to update the plan. And then finally, if you have a beach area, you may need a specific beach restoration plan that focuses primarily on those near shore activities. So um, thank you for your time and attention. And if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you, Fred. Are there any questions at this point? I don't see that any, any of the attendees have any questions, any more questions. Um, Stephanie, do you want to do you want to address the calibration as well? Stephanie had something to add on the calibration. Thanks. Yeah. No, I did want to add something on that because that that's a tough one uh, for a lot of lake associations. So one of the things, and it, believe me, it pains me to say this. One of the nice advantages of the handheld meters from Turner is they have something called a solid secondary state standard. Uh, I'm sorry, a secondary solid state standard. That is really, really nice for lake associations because uh, it's easy to use. And so it, it's, uh, it doesn't require any, if you wanna calibrate the in situ probe that Dr. Libno showed or, or the exo probe that I showed, you have to make solutions of a dye called rhodamine. And that is not a picnic if you don't, if you don't have a, a decent lab or so. I mean, I've done it on my kitchen table, but it's not, it's not easy. Um, and so that's just something I wanted to add since this is a lake association. That is definitely one area where I think Turner has done a very nice job with that solid state standard. The rest of us have not done that yet. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and actually let me add, because I, I should have mentioned this, but New Jersey DP has available um, on loan some of these handheld meters. If an association is interested in, in trying it out. As uh, a matter of fact, I know a lot of people at Lake Apacon today, uh, I believe the commission and foundation have volunteers out and they're collecting data um, with some of these borrowed probes to see you know, if some of the beach communities want to use some of this information. And then Later in the season, when we do our cyanotoxin testing at a PACCOM, we're actually going to coordinate with the volunteers. So we're going to use our meters. And again, we're going to use the two different meters because the one, one key, and I'm sure Stephanie can mention this, um, 
you don't want to jump from meter to meter. You know, you want to, if, if you're developing a database and you're using, say, one of, one of Stephanie's Xylem units, you want to make sure you're using that on a consistent basis because you may have different, you know, um, uh, different relationships de dependent on the meters. Um, so, but yeah, DEP has those meters for loan if, if someone's interested. Okay, and we have a question from Charlie right now. Charlie, you can unmute and talk. Oh, I also like uh, text my question. But my question is, at this time of year in White Middle Lake in the coves, uh, we have a lot of windblown um, pollen. And it seems like we get filamentous algae growing on the windblown pollen. So I'm wondering if we should be concerned with that. Would that dissipate soon or does that algae start to expand? Yeah, I, again, this is from my experience, especially this time of year, because I just this past week, I've gotten maybe three or four different photos of people concerned about the mad algae this year. Typically, if the mad algae is bright green and it tends to be slimy, it's like spirogyra or an associated genus. They prefer cooler waters. So we always recommend hold off, don't treat it, um, let it die off naturally. Because if you're going to treat it, first of all, it's gonna die off naturally. Second of all, you're just releasing nutrients, making it available for other algae. So if it's that bright green slimy stuff, I'd let it die back naturally. Um, then if you have to contend with more of the summer, the heavier stuff, they almost call it like horsehair algae, you squeeze in, it's coarse and, and heavy. That's more of the problematic algae. But this time of the year, especially if it's associated with pollen, it tends to be a spirogyra or a similar genus. I, I, I wouldn't treat that. I would just let it go. Now, obviously, you want to monitor and see if it's going to exacerbate. But in general, that, that material tends to die off naturally. And I have another question. Um, do these, uh, is a cyanobacteria beyond this, the scope or the abilities of the backpacking uh, water purification systems. You know, it's personal beauty, water purif purification gimmicks that you bring with you when you backpack. Uh, is the cyanobacteria beyond the strength of those systems? Um, I, so we work with a number of potable water clients and it's, it's easy for them. Uh, it, when I say easy, it's, it's relatively easy for them to take care of cyanobacteria cells. That number one, in general, they can you know, filter that material out. They can use all sorts of products like alum to, to strip those cells, separate them. Um, they have all sorts of clarifiers that they can add. Um, so as long as they stay on top of things, um, most of the time those materials don't get passed through. There are two issues though. One is, is if the cyanotoxin is not in the algal cell and it's in a dissolved state, that makes it more difficult and it may potentially get through the system. And those criteria I gave were for recreational. The levels for potable water systems for microcystins and cylindrospermopsum are substantially lower than those. Um, and they monitor both the raw and the finished water. Um, so number one, they really have to keep tabs on the dissolved form of the cyanotoxins to make sure that's not getting through. The other thing too is even though they can essentially take care of those compounds. If they have those compounds coming through the system, it's more expensive because they have to use more product, they have to use more labor. They would rather deal with it in the raw water. So very frequently we develop management plans on trying to avoid or minimize the generation of those HABs in the raw water so that it saves them money in the treatment. So it is a very different animal, number one, because it's drinking water and the levels are so low, they're, they're monitoring a lot more closely and they're, um, they have all sorts of ways of dealing with it, whether it's in the algal cell or it's dissolved, um, but it helps to save money if they be proactive as possible. We have another question from Paul. He writes, the toxins from BGs are released on cell death. What about the pigments? I can, I can take that one on if you like. <laughs> um, some are, yes. Uh, so one of the things about the pigments that's interesting, chlorophyll is uh, it's a membrane associated pigment. And so it actually, you know, it has this long tail and it's anchored in the membranes of the cells. So 
most, not all, but most chlorophyll will stay attached to the cell. Um, phycocyanin is a water soluble pigment um, and it is actually kind of hinged to the cell by a, what's called a protein-protein interaction. Usually when a cell dies, that phycocyanin can be released. Uh, that's one of the reasons like when you see an algae bloom that's dying, you get a lot of the blue swirly effect, uh, kind of this marbly effect in, in a dying bloom. Um, th this is also important. I'm actually writing a blog about this right now. It's also, it's also important from uh, an important thing to understand because when you're using these probes that you stick in the water, like, like Dr. Lubno and I both have discussed now, you've got to remember that what the probe is seeing is fluorescence from chlorophyll that's bound to a membrane. And chlorophyll in water acts a little differently. And that's really important because a lot of people compare those measurements to extractions of chlorophyll that they do in a laboratory. Sometimes that looks great. Sometimes it doesn't look so great. And, and this has to do with this differing chemistry. But, but the basic answer to your question is, a lot of phycocyanin is often released when the cells die. The chlorophyll usually uh, stays attached. Some is released, but not to the level that you see with phycocyanin. Yeah, and I just want to say thank you, Stephanie, because that, that, really, that really helps me because when we compare the two methods, we always see that, that there's no tight correlation. And thank you for that information on the phycocyanin. Yeah, Perhaps. we should we should talk about it sometime, Fred, because it's a big, it's a big topic I, I kind of want to get preachy about these days. <laughs> Maybe we could take the last question so we can move on. If there are no questions, I want to thank Fred again for outstanding presentation and slides. And certainly all of us uh, could clearly see the synergy between both presentations, uh, uh, Stephanie and Fred, and uh, really thank you. Uh, I wanna mention to everyone that the copies of the presentations have been approved for release.